Get everybody to find their seats. Uh, this morning is, I told you last week we'd be in Hebrews today. I lied, I have repented, just so you already know. Um, today's going to be a preparatory message for Hebrews, because it's really hard to stop the book of Leviticus and then just launch all the way to Hebrews without kind of spanning some of that stuff in the middle. Uh, and the idea, basically, of today's message is to catch us up from the giving of the law uh, and that Levitical period, if you will, and the, the induction of the sacrificial system and all of those things, to catch us up from there uh, until the New Covenant, until Jesus ushers in the once and for all, forever sacrifice of his own uh, life. So today is going to be preparatory, and at the same time, um, when, I usually when I usually preach a message, I usually start with loose ends, and I try to tie loose ends up by the end of the message. Today, uh, we're starting in, in such a way that there will be so many loose ends at the end of the message that you can't even count them all. Uh, I think there will be a lot of questions in your minds, but again, this is, this is a setup message for Hebrews, and so I'm going to create a lot of loose ends, and to be quite honest with you, um, I'm going to deal with some very difficult biblical truths, some very difficult, I mean, you see, the, the gospel is pretty easy to us in, in a sense, okay, Although it does come against our human pride, it's easy in the sense that uh, somebody took the punishment that I deserve. You see, that's just total good news. And so we can receive that idea pretty easily. Yes, somebody else took the punishment that I deserve, but we'll talk about some facts from the story today from God's Word that are, that are more difficult for our, our human minds to accept. And I pray that you just hang in there and um, by and by. Through the course of time, we'll answer more and more of those questions. Well, Leviticus, uh, we've been looking every week at chapter 26, verses 11 and 12, because it really puts forward the whole idea of the book. And the whole idea from those verses is so that God is providing a way for um, him to be, himself to be in communion with sinful, rebellious people. And so he said, I'm, I'm putting forward this whole system that is um, um, a system in preparation for some great event that would take place. The great event is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he's putting forward a system that will bide the time, okay, that will bide the time until that one great sacrifice of Jesus has been made and he says I'm, I'm putting all of this forward so that there's provision for you to have relationship with me because otherwise you I would incinerate you by my presence uh, he says I'll walk among you I'll be your God you'll be my people my soul will not abhor you which you know we normally abhor people who are incredibly wicked but God's saying he won't abhor us in fact he'll he'll love us and he'll be our God uh, Exodus tells us the purpose of this provision so that these people would be a kingdom of priests. We see this corollary in the New Testament, that we are, 1 Peter chapter 1, a, a royal priesthood. We're given this, uh, this mission of inviting people into relationship with God. And so the book of Leviticus is all about the consecration of these people. Now, consecration is just a big churchy sounding word that means being set apart for something. And so these people who are called to be a kingdom of priests are being set apart by God to do this priestly work in the world. But instead, the people of Leviticus went their own way. They abandoned the mission. And the rest of the Old Testament is a sorry story of their history. It is a sorry story of their continued, continued and perpetual rebellion how God would save them and they would fall right back into the same mess they'd been in before their story is one of tragically self-inflicted suffering now all of us know something of that don't we we all know something of doing some bad things doing some wrong things making some poor decisions and having to reap the consequences of that 
but those are moments in our lives, and we tend to think of the, the most of our life as positive. But when you read from a history standpoint, a survey of the history of the people of Israel, man, it's just self-inflicted suffering one year after another after another after another. It's, it's a pretty sad read, ultimately. There would be uh, indeed periods of revival, but they were always kind of short-lived and falling back into wrong ways of living. Within 40 years of the giving of the law, God gives the law on Mount Sinai. Moses comes down from the mountain, and, and he, he helps them to understand all the law. They build the tabernacle, which is this huge tent that would be in the midst of their camp. And um, all of this takes place. And within 40 years of this, the people would take possession of what God had promised Abraham, this place called the Promised Land. He said, I'm going to give you this land, and this is where your people, your descendants, will live after you. And he promised him that he would have this place, that his descendants would have it. Um, the people were not obedient when they entered the land of Canaan. They allowed these very wicked Canaanite people that God had uh, quite honestly commanded them to destroy all of them, to eradicate the very wicked, very evil, idolatrous, willfully rebellious people in Canaan. He would said, get rid of all of them. And they refused, and they lived side by side next to the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite, and we could go through this long list of ites. All of these people were sometimes sacrificing their sons and daughters on the fire to pagan gods. I mean, murdering their own children in sacrifice of some bloodthirsty god. And um, it was a sad idea that these people would begin to influence the people of Israel, and so they would lose their unique influence in the world by starting to look like the peoples around them. Uh, the, peop the period of the book of the Judges marks a particular sorry time in their history. Uh, after adopting the wicked practices of the people around them, Israel was allowed to suffer, uh, suffer under the oppression of heavy-handed tyrants, the kings of these other nations. Listen to these verses of commentary from the writer of Judges. Chapter 2, verse 16. It says, and I'm going to... I'm going to hit a lot of scripture this morning, a lot. Like I said, today is kind of like you are um, standing wanting a drop of water, and I'm going to hit you with a fire hydrant, okay? I'm just confessing beforehand that's what's coming. Judges chapter 2, verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. So these people, uh, the people of Israel had been idolatrous. They'd been wicked. God has allowed the suffering of oppression to come. And then God would raise up judges, and they would save them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they, being Israel, did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Judges chapter 17, verse 6 is probably the verse that helps us understand the entire book. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And the book of Judges tells us what happens to a people. What hap happens to a nation. What happens to a, a, a group of people who just start doing what's right in their own eyes. They have God's clear law in front of them and they set it aside and say, we, we'll do our own thing. We'll go about life our own way. And they became relativists. You do what's right for you, I'll do what's right for me. The only problem is when I think what's right for me, you think it's very, very wrong for you, and I take your stuff, and then there's all kinds of stuff, right? Well, these are the kind of things that were taking place. Later, Israel would ask for a king. Uh, they wanted to be more and more like the peoples around them. They all had kings. They wanted a king. They couldn't be a legitimate nation without a king, or so they thought. So... Yahweh, who was their covenant God, who had delivered them out of Egypt, uh, was unsatisfactory for them as far as a monarch goes. They wanted a king they could see and they could hear with their own ears. So God gave them kings. Isn't it a sad thing sometimes when God gives us what we want? Their glory days were best seen in the reign of King David and Solomon, but even those days were marred by the stain of the human condition. 
We see sinfulness continually even throughout the, the, the two greatest kings that Israel ever had. Uh, Solomon, I am always so puzzled. I'm, I struggle so much with the story. All of these wives and concubines that he had. And he begins to erect all these altars to pagan gods within the borders of Israel. And even the best of their kings weren't that great. The priests and the people would, by and large, ignore the whole point of the sacrificial system so that God would send prophets like Amos to say things like this. Amos chapter 5, verse 21, God says to the people, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Now, interesting thing about these feasts and these solemn assemblies, they were prescribed by God. God had told them the feasts that they would celebrate. He had told them what their solemn assemblies were to be like and when they were to be held. And he says, I hate it, I despise these things. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. He wouldn't accept offerings that he had prescribed. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Turn or take away from me the noise of your songs. Imagine if God were to descend into our worship service any given Sunday, and after we've been singing and praising and clapping and raising our hands, God were to say, Take away from me the noise of your songs. Take away the melody of your harps. I will not listen, he says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Isaiah chapter 1 has a similar passage of Scripture where God says these similar kinds of things to the people of Judah. And why? Why? Why is he saying this things, these things to them? Because he says your heart is not in them. And so when people bring a form of religion, but they deny the godliness of a submissive heart to God, God says, I don't want anything to do with that. All the while, various prophets such as Elijah and Elisha and as well as so many others would declare God's word to the kings and to the people. They would call them to repent and turn to God. By and large, a deaf ear was turned and sometimes even open hostility to the prophets. After God's patience had warned then, he would send nations who had no relationship with God at all, to conquer his people and to even export them to other nations around the world. In 722 B.C., the ten northern tribes would be finally conquered by the Assyrian invaders. They were carted off. Finally, uh, Samaria was just decimated and all of the people are just carted off into captivity. Then in 597, the two southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin who thought, well, it could happen to the ten northern tribes, but never to us. We are the true people of God. We worship God rightly. We worship him in the temple. In 597, they would be conquered and largely deported to Babylon. The prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, as well as the minor prophets, had a lot to say to Israel and Judah about their rebellion and how God would still save. They would be handed over from one nation to another for a while. All leading up to the advent of their Messiah. Isn't, isn't this a strange history? For a people that God has covenanted himself to. In love had provided everything necessary for them to live in right relationship with him, at least in a preparatory state, preparing for that one great sacrifice later of Jesus. Isn't this a, 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 an odd history for a people like this, that God has said, I will make you a people for my own name. This isn't how we would write the book. It's certainly not how I would write it. Write it. The heroes would look far better than they do. Even the heroes of the story are tainted, sinful individuals. The heroes would look better and there wouldn't be nearly so many villains in the book. Strange, strange history. God had revealed himself to Israel in ways that other nations could only hope for. He had shown up to deliver them miraculously in so many ways. 
And yet they did not worship the Lord their God and serve him only. They didn't. The very beginning of the commandment list. I think this is a portrait of unbelief and its radical effects on the human race. The radical effects of unbelief, the radical effects of sin on the human race. Adam and Eve introduced us to this type of unbelief through their sin in the garden and the conditions have ravaged the human race since then. It's only progressed from worse to worse. It progressed until the time when God would send plagues in Egypt and part the Red Sea and cause water to come out of a rock. Again, this sinful people, God would show up in power and miraculously save. And even after they've seen God do all of these incredible things to demonstrate His care for them, they still walked away. Over and over and over again, they still walked away. During the whole Old Covenant, the people of Israel fell into one of three camps. One of three camps. First, the moralists. The moralists. These are the people who took the law of God very seriously and tried to use it in an illegitimate way. They took the law of God very seriously but tried to use the law in an illegitimate way. And then there were the relativists. These are the people that we read about in Judges. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So the relativists see God's law and go, I don't need that, we'll do it our way. So you've got the moralists who take God's law seriously, the relativists who pretty much reject God's law and say, I'll do my own thing. And then you have a remnant of people, a small group ultimately throughout the whole Israel, uh, the whole history of Israel that we, I would call, I just, I don't know what else to call them. They're the gospel dependents. They're the gospel dependents. And by gospel, I simply mean that they believed the good news that God would save them. They didn't know about Jesus yet. They didn't really understand the, all the, the fullness of prophecy. And, but they knew that God was gracious and good. And if they cast their whole weight on him, he would save them. The moralists, the relativists, and the gospel dependents. In the second message of the Leviticus series, I introduced this concept of the remnant. Uh, There was, within the ethnic people of Israel, a true Israel. There was, within the nation, a smaller nation, if you will. These were men and women who trusted in God's provision for their right standing with God. They understood the sacrificial system rightly. God had revealed things to them, and they, through faith, had come into right relationship with God, and they weren't trying to climb a ladder to get to God through keeping the law. They were instead depending on God to save them and all of their deficiencies. So what I want to do for the rest of our time is to explain to you what went wrong as best I can. What went wrong? It all revolved around God's gracious gift of the law in one way or another. And there is this great mystery and a great number of arguments and great confusion, and I won't clear all of it up today, about law and gospel. And, and what, is a, what is the connection between these two things? Is law, it's for the Old Testament people, that's for the old story, that's done away with, complete, and now we're just in the new, and it's all just grace and good. And what is the connection of these things? And The history of Israel all revolved around how they understood God's law. Paul, in the New Testament, who'd been a teacher of the old law, he had been a Pharisee of Pharisees, Philippians tells us, uh, an incredibly important man, very knowledgeable and learned, had the Old Testament memorized. Here's what he has to say. He gives us insight into into what the law does and how it can be taken advantage of. The law, either the law written on the heart or the law written on stone tablets like God gave Moses at Sinai, was taken advantage of through sin. In Romans chapter 7, and this is, this is a hard text, and I'm just trying to pull out a few things as we go along and help us to see some things this morning. But as I said, I know I'll leave loose ends. Romans chapter 7, verse 5. Paul says, For, for while we were yet living in the flesh, our sinful passions... 
aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So think of this. God gives a law, a gracious gift to govern his people, Israel, to help them understand how to relate to him. And this law is at work in their members bearing fruit for death. You see, there's a problem right off the bat. But now we are released from the law, Paul says, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. I mean, it sounds like the law's a bad thing, right? The law's got to be a bad thing if it's producing death in us. Absolutely not, Paul says. He comes against that in the strongest way possible in the Greek with a, with, with a Greek phrase that, that means, may it never be, God forbid. He says, if, I had not, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not, not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Sin takes advantage of the commandment and produces death. The very commandment, verse 10, that promised life, Proved to be death to me. What does he mean? Well, God had said in the Old Covenant, live by these and you'll live. But he says, it promised life, but it's producing death. The very commandment, I'm sorry, uh, verse 11. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, get this, producing death in me through what is good. In order that sin might be shown to be sin. See here, we we see a glimmer of good news here. There's a glimmer of good news here. So that sin might be shown to be sin. We wouldn't know we are sinners if the law did not show us that we are sinners. The law is, we could use lots of illustrations here. It's like a searchlight that shows us our darkness. It shows us what's wrong. We can do what we want in the dark and not know any better. But when the law comes, then we see, we know what right and wrong is. And it's very important that we know what right and wrong is. He he continues, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. All right, I want you to follow with me here for a minute. So I want want to take um, a period like the judges, for instance, okay? Israel's idolatrous. They're doing what's right in their own eyes, which means they've rejected God's law. But does that mean the law no longer holds sway? No. The law is still there, and they are still guilty in its eyes, okay? So Israel is idolatrous, but, uh, and, and so God allows or sends suffering. Israel cries out for deliverance. God hears and mercifully sends a deliverer. These deliverers, called judges, they were all types of Christ. They were all types, shadows, if you will, that pointed to the one great deliverer to come. The deliverer would come and the people would go free. But what would Israel do? They would return back to idolatry. Why did this sad cycle repeat itself over and over and over again? Because sin seized opportunity through the commandment, deceived them, and through it killed them. The people of Israel were living in a continual death produced by sin's advantage through the law. What do we mean? We mean that although God's law is good, it's good for the purpose of revealing death and inability. 
the law reveals that we are dead through sin and unable, Romans tells us, unable to fulfill the demands of the law. God says obey, and he gives this list of things to obey. And what gets revealed in the process is that we can't obey it. Not only that we can't obey it, we're dead because of sin's advantage through the law. This is critical because you need to understand from the whole giving of the law all the way through the Old Testament, this is the relationship that people are having with the law. It's killing them. Sin is taking advantage through the commandment. And they're all dying. They're, being, they're born dead through original sin. And then through their own active participation against God's law, this, the commandment is killing them. You know, this doesn't sound good but it's actually very, very good. It's actually very, very good. The law doesn't produce death. It merely shows us that we are dead. And if something is drastically wrong with you, don't you need to know it? We we all say, you know, in counseling, like admitting the problem is the first step in recovery or whatever okay so that whole idea you, you've got to admit that there's a problem we see it's the law that shows us we have a problem so actually the law is pretty good news showing us that we have a problem that before we were unaware of and wouldn't seek any help for sin is the thing that is busy killing us through the law and the law shows us this it The law is, if you will, a mirror that shows us that we're dead. It's a mirror. Mirror, We always say mirrors don't lie, do they? They don't hide the pounds. They don't hide the wrinkles. The the mirror's going to tell us the truth. And the law is a mirror, and it's going to show us all the wrinkles. It's going to show us the human stain of sinfulness. That's what the law is going to do. Spiritually speaking, the the mirror of the law shows us death and decay. It shows us that we are, in fact, spiritual zombies. We are decaying from the inside out, from the moment we're born. We are dead and yet animated for physical life. How do we see this? How does the law become for us this mirror? How do, we, how do we gain the ability to see what the law is showing us? Because remember, we're dead. Dead people don't see anything. How do, we, how do we see this? How do we get our eyes open to this mirror? How is it that we know that sin is killing us through the law? How could the old covenant people of God know and see the true import of the law, the true significance and meaning of the law. Well, it's a miracle, really. It's a miracle. It's called, the Bible says, regeneration, quite simply. In the Old and New Covenant, God enlivens the dead heart that was killed by sin so that we can see what the mirror is showing us. Otherwise, we don't see the law as a mirror. We might, see as a, we might see it as a ladder to climb our way to God. We might reject it out of hand and say, I'll do it my own way. The only way the human heart can see that the law is a mirror showing them their death through sin, the only way they can see that is when God enlivens a heart. God gives the law so that people might see themselves in the mirror, a true portrait of their inability so that they might live by faith in the promises of God to save. You see, the people of God in the Old Covenant were saved the exact same way that people in the New Covenant are saved. There have been uh, some odd teaching 
over the years, really over 2,000 years of church history, as to how people were saved in the Old Covenant, how they're saved in the New Covenant. They were saved in the Old Covenant through works and now through faith. No, the covenants are unified in the teaching that we are saved by grace through faith and that alone. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, an old covenant prophet, an Old Testament dude. He says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. The idea of living here isn't that we will be animated and keep doing what we have to do. The idea of living here in the Hebrew is accepted. The righteous shall be accepted by his faith. The righteous shall be in covenant with God through his faith. This is an Old Testament text, not a New Covenant one. And yet it's jumped on by New Covenant writers, isn't it? See, obedience to the law cannot put us right with God. Paul, this converted Jewish teacher, makes this case in Galatians and in Romans, specifically. And then in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, he mirrors this same thought, having introduced the gospel as the power of God to salvation, not keeping the law, the gospel. Romans 1, 16, he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it... In it, the right, uh, the law. For in it, for in the law, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteousness. I'm sorry, the righteous shall live by faith. He goes back. He seizes this quote of this Old Testament author, and he says, "You see, the covenants are unified. The covenants come together in this whole idea that God's always been saving by grace through faith." Well, was the gospel hidden in the New Covenant? Or, I'm sorry, was the gospel hidden until the New Covenant? No. Was it only partly visible through types and shadows? Yes. It was only partly visible through types and shadows in the Old Covenant. You see, we've been in Leviticus for several months, and we have seen the gospel in the book of Leviticus, haven't we? But how do we see it? We see it as people who stand on this side. Let's be honest. They could not see and understand all that we can see and understand. There's something that's called progressive revelation, which means God has been showing more and more of himself and his plan to redeem humanity. He's been showing more and more of it as the years go by, and especially through this, his revealed word from Old to New Testament. Okay? We see... The gospel in Leviticus as those who um, stand on this side of the cross. Those who were in that context, receiving the law, hearing this, they were saved by grace through faith in the good promises of God that he'd made a way. Through substitutionary sacrifice, which alluded to, pointed to, in shadow, Jesus' sacrifice. It is important, though. It's, I think it's very important. I, whether we struggle with it or not, it's important for us to understand why the Jews as a whole, why the nation as a whole, did not experience God's ultimate salvation during the Old Covenant. I mean, the majority of them didn't. There was always a remnant. You, you might remember when Elijah thought he was the only one, right? I'm the only prophet. I'm the only person who, who serves the one true God. And God says, no, 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 quit commiserating. I've got a remnant of all these thousands of men who've not bowed their knee to Baal. Okay? God says, there's, all, there's always a remnant. Um, Romans chapter 9 through 11, especially chapter 11, introduces this concept of the remnant very heavily. But why did they not experience God's ultimate salvation? Why did most of them not? These people didn't rightly process the information that the mirror could show them. 
Romans chapter 9, verse 30. Paul says there, What shall we say then? That Gentiles, Gentiles, they were not given the law on stone tablets, okay? They were not involved in the covenant people of God, except for those few who came in, Ruth and others who came in and, and submitted their hearts to God through faith, all right? Um, he says, Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That whole idea was infuriating to the Jews. What do you mean, Gentiles? They, didn't, they weren't even given the law. How could they get to have relationship with God? He says they've attained it, that is, a righteousness by faith. But Israel pursued a law that would lead to righteousness but they didn't succeed in reaching that law. They didn't succeed in reaching the law that could lead to righteousness. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. The majority of the Jewish nation viewed the law as a ladder not a mirror. This is very important. They viewed it as a ladder. If I'm a good person, if I obey the Sabbath, if I um, keep the commandments, if I don't commit adultery, if I don't covet, if I don't steal, if I keep all of the case law, if I, if I can do it, then I will climb the ladder. I might climb slower because of some failure here and there, but, but I'll keep climbing the ladder to God. And I'll ultimately have relationship with him through my efforts. He says they pursued it based as if it were based on works. He said they've stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Jesus was this stone personified, but the idea... The, the, the stumbling idea, the offensive idea, is that you can't put yourself right with God. Jesus personified that. He came as a rescuer, a savior. The Jews were living as if they didn't need one. We'll just keep climbing the ladder. They pursued the law hoping righteousness would come from it based on their works. In the Old Covenant, the law, which was a gracious gift, had been mishandled, misused, and misunderstood. Paul says clearly here that they pursued the law as if it were based on works. They viewed it that way even though it wasn't designed to work that way. They were supposed to pursue the law that would lead to righteousness by faith. This means they would have to trust God solely for their right standing with him. And you know what? We think that the Jews are so stupid sometimes when we read this Old Testament history and think, how in the world could they have seen the parting of the Red Sea and then started worshiping a golden calf? But they're no different than we are. Because we have the same thing in us that they have in them. And it's the desire to work it out. We'll work it out. We'll put it together. We'll make things right. We'll knuckle down. Give far more effort than before. Discipline ourselves. And we can get it right. We're just like them. Only through faith are we saved. Because our damnable good works will get us in a heap of trouble. You see, these people who, this part of the remnant who came to God in faith could actually view the law as sweet. Man, Paul says... <laughs> Sin seized opportunity through the law and killed me. How is it then that the law can be viewed as sweet? 
These people trusted God's promises. Remember what Habakkuk says, the righteous shall live by faith. They'll be accepted by faith. And so the law became to them a way of expressing love for God and one's neighbor. In this, the law is sweet. And so David could say in Psalm 119, verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Read Psalm 119. The whole thing is this this view of the law that can only be expressed by a converted heart. It can only be expressed by the converted heart. For the person who has received righteousness by faith, the law becomes a wonderful guide. The law has lost its condemning power for the repentant sinner. You see, the only way I can think of the law as sweet is if I no longer feel condemned by it. So long as I feel condemned by the law, so long as I hear the law say, do not do this, and then I end up doing it, and I go, oh my gosh, I feel the weight of the law on my own head. Only when I look and realize the weight of the law came down on Jesus' head. Only then does the law lose its condemning power. Then we read the law, we observe its commands as the Spirit of God enables us to do so. Now we can submit ourselves to the law of God, not for our salvation's sake, but as an expression of love to God. It's not that the law has no more sway in the life of a believer at all. No, it's just simply that the law is no longer our condemnation. Now it's our God in love. However, if we approach the moral commands of God as if obedience to them can put us right with God, then we die. Listen, listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For those who rely on the works of the law, those who see the law as a ladder to, that they can get to God with, it's a curse. Cursed be everyone, it continues, who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Romans 11 tells us the same thing. If you want to try to live by the law, then you have to obey all the law. You see, the curse that he talks about here is the curse of death. It's the curse that's first pronounced in Genesis chapter 3 after man's rebellion, and it stands for us all. We are all, if we are not, under the blood, through faith, then we are under the curse. Um, The curse is reiterated so that people might despair of pursuing the law with a performance mentality. We see, well, did God actually tell them that that the law couldn't save them? Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And all the people shall say amen. If they said amen, they should have been saying amen with the realization that we can't do it. We've got to trust God for it. Cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of the law. I mean, what kind of person can read the law and think that they're doing it? Only a self-deluded person, which is all of those who are living in unbelief in one manner or another. Ezekiel 18, verse 4, he tells him, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins or transgresses the law, I supplied that, shall die. Well, all of these people know that they had sinned. And God says the penalty is death. You see, if if one reads the law in the Old Covenant, they should come away crushed and crying for a Savior. But there's a problem, (laughs) a huge problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14, explains the problem a little bit. He says, but their minds were hardened. They read the law, and their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Because only through Christ is it taken away. Remember the veil of the temple? 
that same veil still stands for those who are reading the Old Covenant, trying to find their salvation through obedience to it. The veil that covered Moses' face to, to, hide the, or to, to hide his face from the, the glory uh, the, to, to, find, uh, to hide the glory of his face from the people. That veil was a blinding veil for these people, and they couldn't see the purposes of God. He says, verse 15, yet to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Let's go back to that first verse real quick. He says, but their minds were hardened. Well, hardened by what? Well, their own unbelief. Their own depravity. Their own willful twisting of the law's purpose. They saw the law as a ladder to God. But that's not the only hardening. There is a more difficult hardening. That Hebrews, I'm sorry, um, Romans 11 tells us about. There's a more difficult hardening that is difficult to, um, to understand. Verse 7 of chapter 11, Paul says, yeah, I don't have this before behind you, I don't think, because I forgot to give it to Steve. I actually, I just... It came to me a little while ago. Anyway, verse 11. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. What was it seeking? Righteousness that they thought would come through obedience to the law. They failed to obtain what they were seeking. The elect obtained it. Yeah, interesting concept. The elect obtained it. But the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor. Eyes that would not see. And ears that would not hear. Down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. There is the hardening of unbelief. And then in some sense, which I really won't try to explain. God is involved in giving a spirit of stupor. To. The, the nation of his covenant. That's. That's hard. Won't deny it. But I won't try to dance my way around it either. Back to that 1 Corinthians 3 text. It's only when one turns to the Lord that the veil is removed. He says there in that 1 Corinthians 3 text, um, um, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Well, praise God, it can be removed. So when this veil is removed, then we can see the law for what it is. A mirror, not a ladder. Okay? If... We can see that it's a teacher leading us to see our continual need for Christ. And so it's leading us to continual repentance. We know that as Christians standing on this side of the cross. We see the law. We read the law. And so it tells us that we need to repent. And this cycle of repentance and faith is the cycle of our lives. It's also our guide showing us what loving service to God empowered by the Spirit looks like. But this veil is only lifted after one turns to the Lord. He says, when one turns to the Lord, it is lifted. What causes a person to turn to the Lord? In a word, God does. In a word, God causes the heart to turn to God. God causes a person to turn to him. If he does not do this, they can never turn to him. Romans chapter 11 verse 6 says without faith, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11 6 says without faith it is impossible to please God. Well, turning to God is a pretty pleasing thing. Romans 8 7 says that the fleshly or natural mind is unable to submit to God. Turning to the Lord is submission to the Lord. 
A natural man, the Bible teaches, is dead in transgressions and in sins. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. The people of the Old Covenant were dead. If they were not part of the remnant, if their minds had not been enlivened, they were dead. They were unable to turn to God in saving faith. Sin had seized the opportunity through the law and had killed them. In a very theologically packed discussion, Jesus talks to a man, a leader of the Jews. This guy would have known the deal, all right? He knew the Bible like Paul had known the Bible. He'd been this Jewish teacher, this Jewish leader. And, and Jesus has this discussion with Nicodemus. Um, and Jesus alerts him to something that, he, that is critically important, but the man is unaware of. The phrase Jesus uses to express this state of being alive to God is the phrase born again. Born again. Now, we've probably heard that. If you grew up in the church, you've heard that all your life. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. Which of you ever asked to be born the first time? What baby ever asks to be born? You see, being born is something that we experience being done to us it's a cause on us not something induced by a decision we make chapter 3 of john chapter 3 here's the discussion that jesus has with nicodemus jesus answered him truly truly i say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of god what does it mean to see the kingdom of god um well, first of all, it means to see myself rightly in light of the law. Before I can appreciate anything about God's kingdom, I have to see that I'm not in it. And short of faith, I'm not going to be in it. So he, he says, I, I'm telling you, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He doesn't get it. How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is of flesh, I'm sorry, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, here's his explanation of how this new birth happens. The wind, does he, anybody know what he's talking about? The wind? The Holy Spirit of God. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound. Or in other words, he's using a human analogy to refer to the wind of God's Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The wind of God's Spirit moves where it chooses, enlivening dead hearts as he chooses. So follow my logic here. In order to have the veil removed, 1 Corinthians 3, whenever they read the law, there's still a veil over their hearts. Okay, Their hearts are hardened. So in order to have the veil removed from an old covenant Jew who's reading the Old Covenant, one has to turn to the Lord. If a person is to turn to the Lord, then they need the ability to do that. Um, because dead people don't do anything. So in Jesus' conversation with this leader of the Jews, he basically says that people need to be born again or born of the Spirit. Who does that work? The Holy Spirit does that work. So the overwhelming deficiency of the Old Covenant is that God himself has not chosen during this administration, the Old Covenant administration, he's not chosen during that administration to pour out his spirit in such a way that the majority of people in Israel would pursue the law by faith. God has not poured out his spirit in this pervasive way that we would see after the new covenant is initiated. 
while the people of the old covenant were responsible to repent of their sins and trust God, they didn't do so for the most, most part. God commands the whole human race to repent and believe, and yet only some do. And here's my question. Is this due simply to the choice of an individual? Is this due simply to the choice of an individual? Well, biblically, it can't be perceived that way. It just, it just can't. Not if we're going to be faithful to the text. It can't be perceived that way because the Bible paints a graphic picture of the pervasive death of humanity. In order to paint a graphic picture of this death, God gives an Old Testament prophet named Ezekiel a vision of a valley of dry bones. Verse 1 in chapter 37, The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel says, and he brought me out of the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around them, and behold, they were, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. How did that happen? God caused breath to enter this valley of dry bones. This is a vivid depiction of the reigning death over natural humanity. He even goes as far as to say the bones were very dry. It's also a vivid depiction of the required movement of God to cause life. While God commanded the Jewish people to obey the law, he was under no delusion that they would do so. God was under no delusion that they would do so. God was not unaware that he had to cause them to live and cause them to obey. God gave a righteous commandment and did not, for the most part, enable the whole nation to obey if he had, they would have obeyed. We would have a very different Old Testament story. God is righteous to command obedience, but he is not required to enable obedience. Now that's hard, and I know it. Quite honestly, I don't like it. But God did not counsel with me when writing Scripture. He can, if he chooses, leave humanity to their own devices. And he does. I mean, if we have a hard time with this idea, I mean, how hard of a time would we have with the fact that the only nation he chose was this little scrubby nation of Israel? There were a lot of other people in the world that God did not reveal himself to at all in any sense other than general revelation to seeing the light of the sun and the rain that comes down, comes down on the just and the unjust. But he is free to leave humanity to their own devices if he chooses to do so, and he did that with a massive portion of ethnic Israel because a massive portion of ethnic Israel was not living in covenant by faith. God is not required to intervene, and yet in his grace he absolutely does for many. There was a remnant. Now I know that this might make you uncomfortable with God, and quite honestly you'll just have to sort that out with him. Go to the text and look for the answers to questions there, not in, well, I believe and my mama told me. And th Go to the text for your answers. Go to the text to resolve those things that can be resolved by the text. 
But God's word is clear, uh, and no one can do what they are commanded to do because they're all dead. And unless God does something, unless God does a work, we're without hope. Ephesians 2 and Colossians 1 both says that God makes us alive. And if you're spiritually alive, it's because God's made you so. Not because you climbed the ladder far enough. Not because you, in a moment of your own decision, mustered up faith. Faith, Ephesians 2.8 says, 2.8.9 says, is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest any man should boast. You see, you don't have a part in your salvation. God owns the whole part. Well, so for purposes known to God, he delays, he chooses to delay the full outpouring of his spirit. Get this, this is, this is significant. Until his son arrives and finishes his high priestly work. The pouring out of God's spirit. In, when we look at the all of time together, roughly correlates with and comes after Jesus finishes the high priestly work of the book of Leviticus. He fulfills everything that the law required. And when Jesus fulfills the demands of the whole law, God pours out his spirit in a way that he's never that he had never done so before in the old covenant. Y'all remember Peter preaching a sermon and three thousand people getting saved at one time let me tell you what that is that's the spirit of god being poured out in such lavish fashion why to glorify his son the high priest has made atonement the high priest has put right forever those people who believe in faith those people who've been caused to be alive by God. In the Old Covenant, God also dispensed the grace of salvation, but never like this. I mean, from the time of, of Jesus' death and resurrection until now, the gospel is growing and abounding and increasing and producing fruit the world over. Millions of people around the globe are being saved. The, the, the continent of Africa is being ravaged by the glorious riches of the gospel. The Holy Spirit of God is being poured out in a phenomenal, fish, in a phenomenal way. People in, in China, in the house church movement, are being saved by the millions. Romans 11 says, tells us that for a time God has set, us, set apart, has set aside, he has hardened his people Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles would come in. And then he will... Return his attention to them. Now I know I've got a lot of covenant theology brothers in the room. And I love you all. I believe in the end God has a, still has a special plan and purpose for God's ethnic people Israel. I make no bones about it. I believe he will continue and keep his covenant with these people. In the Old Testament prior to the coming of the Messiah. The covenant nation of God did one of three things. They either trusted in their own ability to fulfill the covenant, which is moralism, or they turned to the mentality pervasive during the period of the judges, which was relativism, or they trusted in God alone to save them. And it was God's work that brought these people into gospel dependency. Now, we're blessed more richly than we can imagine to live in this age of God's Spirit being poured out in this way to glorify the high priestly work of His Son. Next week, we'll open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews and read about Jesus who has come to be a better word for us. But I wanted you to know that in the meantime, what was happening from Leviticus until Jesus arrived? There was a hardening. There was a rebellion. There was willful defiance of God and his, his rulership 
in the lives of people. There was a refusal to submit to God and obey the covenant. And yet God has always faithfully been calling people to himself, the remnant. Let's pray.